Okay, everybody, welcome to your last lecture in Module 1, Focus on Race, race and Ethnicity uh, and its Intersections with Anthropology. So in our last class on this kind of subject for this semester, I want to focus on the idea of a kind of post-racial America, which was reiterated many times during the candidacy and presidency of Barack Obama. And I want to dive in a little bit deeper into the idea of race and its intersections with election politics, building on the article that you guys read for today in class. Before we dive into the Obama campaign and more contemporary intersections between race and elections, I want to just give a little bit of background on the role of race in American presidential elections more broadly. So this kind of history can be characterized in four, in terms of like four main eras. The strongest era, the strongest influence of race on elections it came perhaps not surprisingly in the 1860s, just on the cusp of the Civil War. So during this period, the Democratic Party was actually dominated by pro-slavery plantation owners in the American Southeast. The Republican Party was actually founded in 1854 as a coalition opposing the extension of slavery into Western territories. In 1860, there was a deep split between the Southern and Northern Democrats over this issue of slavery, which propelled Lincoln, the Republican candidate at the time, to victory. Lincoln's election precipitated the secession of seven Southern states from the Union, essentially preempting what became the Civil War. When Lincoln went up for re-election in 1864, he was widely heralded as the quote-unquote great emancipator. The efforts of Lincoln and other radical Republicans during Reconstruction in the South helped freed slaves further cement the party's kind of pro-black legacy and really solidified Southerners' loyalty to the Democratic Party. A second era of racialized politics began uh, with what was called the Compromise of 1877. So this Compromise of 1877 was an unwritten deal informally arranged among U.S. congressmen in which Southern Democrats basically traded an end to this post-Civil War kind of reconstruction period of the South for Republican control of the White House. The election of Republican Rutherford B. Hayes resulted in a general withdrawal of troops from South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana, and the withdrawal of the Republican Party from Southern politics more broadly. Black Republicans felt deeply betrayed by this arrangement as it meant that they lost power and were increasingly subjected to voting rights suppression in these Southern states dominated by the Southern Democratic Party. The majority of white voters, on the other hand, supported national Democrat, Democratic candidates well into the 20th century before shifting to the Republican Party. Some kind of early foreshadowing of renewed attention to racial issues began with disputes in the Democratic Convention of 1948 over President Harry S. Truman's executive order to racially integrate the armed forces. Truman's executive order resulted in a walkout of conservative Southerners. And Truman's successor as the Democratic nominee were basically unwilling to risk further schisms within the party and selected both candidates, uh, selected Southern running mates. In this era of American public policy, uh, there was a kind of general perception that there wasn't a lot of difference between Democratic and Republican parties or their presidential candidates in terms of the question of civil rights. This begins to change, though, starting in the 1960s with the election of John F. Kennedy. 
A third radical era begins in 1963. Northern Democrats asserted leadership in promoting civil rights. This was a, a, a critical turning point came in all of this in 1963 when John F. Kennedy's administration confronted Governor George Wallace uh, of Alabama over the desegregation of the University of Alabama. And subsequently, JFK came to take a firm stance actually promoting major civil rights legislation. Within a year of this kind of strong assertion in promoting uh, civil rights, Kennedy was assassinated, causing a nearly total regional split within the Democratic Party over the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This Civil Rights Act of 1964 led to further Southern Democrat defection from the party and towards the Republican Party and the selection of staunch opponents of the Civil Rights Act as representatives. Senator Barry Goldwater uh, was a Republican presidential nominee set up against Lyndon B. Johnson, the Democratic, uh, the Democratic uh, candidate following Kennedy's assassination. Johnson won in a landslide over Barry Goldwater, but the Democratic Party had become deeply split internally over race, with Northern Democrats promoting a pro-civil rights platform, Southern Democrats largely leaving the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. In the following years, the Democratic Party splintered further over racial issues, with Southern and working class whites defecting to the Republican Party. After 1968, Richard Nixon and his Republican successors began to deploy what was known as the, quote, Southern strategy, which was, which was uh, an appeal to racial conservatism in order to attract white Southern voters. Meanwhile, Democratic candidates began to run on an explicitly pro-civil rights platform. Most scholars of voting behavior agree that a gradual party realignment occurred following 1968, centrally on the basis of racial issues, with many racially conservative whites permanently defecting from the Democrats to the Republicans. The fourth and more contemporary era of kind of race and politics began with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. Reagan was a longtime opponent of civil rights and a supporter of strong state rights, which really appealed to racially conservative Southerners. Reagan also drew support from Southern conservators over tax cuts, strong national defense, and alliances with religious conservatives. And it's here that we really see the birth of the contemporary Republican platform with Reagan. Later campaigns perpetuated the prominent, prominence of racial issues within their platforms. For example, Jesse Jackson was Jesse Jackson's first presidential campaign, which took place in 1984, really accelerated the departure of Southern whites from the Democratic Party. In 1988, George Bush employed racially provocative materials regarding black criminals in his campaigns. Even Bill Clinton, who was quite popular among African American voters, began to distance himself from traditional black leaders like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton over fears of further disaffection of white voters from the Democratic Party. Instead, Clinton advocated for liberal policies with implicitly racial implications like welfare and crime, but without having the same explicit overtones as civil rights. In short, elections in the pre-Obama era, stretching from 1980 to 2004, maintained this kind of party polarization over racial issues that had begun in the 1860s, but had evolved over time with Democrats and Republicans shifting their position in relationship to racial conservatism. So, what I'm curious to hear from you guys is what does it mean to be post-racial? 
So as you read in the article for today, from the moment that Barack Obama entered the national spotlight, he had been cast by the media as the perfect kind of antidote to America's corrosive racial politics, which I've just kind of documented have existed since the 1860s. Um, for over a hundred years, right? So on November 5th in 2008, the media reported a kind of nation wrapped in this euphoria about electing its first black president and hailed the beginning of this kind of post-racial America. So if you're in class, we would have a moment to discuss what this idea of post-racialness means. And if you're at home, go ahead and take a moment to write down some thoughts. So according to scholar Relina Joseph, post-race or post-raciality has two meanings that are often conflated. On the one hand, post-racial refers to the existence of a post-race era that proves that the civil rights era accomplished its goals of equality. Therefore, a post-racial era is one in which racism has no significance because equality has been achieved. On the other hand, living in a post-racial era means living in a time in which race itself is not significant. This suggests that we may be, if not already, colorblind. This is a very privileged perspective that ignores what still needs to be done in order to achieve social justice for all members of society. From a non-privileged perspective, post-racial politicking is really just wishful thinking. One measure of a post-racial moment, and whether we're in it or not, may be increasing interracial marriage across uh, racial and ethnic groups. So census statistics reveal that the population of multiracial children in the United States has soared from roughly 500,000 in 1970 to more than 6.8 million in 2000. In the graph behind me, you can see the percentage of interracial, multiracial uh, children by, by state. So you can see that California and Nevada actually have really high uh, numbers of multiracial um, families, as well as here in Arizona. So in a presumed post-racial nation, kind of these ethnically ambiguous children are assumed to be able to kind of transcend race because they are multiple races and are considered a kind of new model minority. In this kind of idea about American society, race is seen as something that can be put on and taken off whenever necessary and convenient. Through a growing list of kind of multiracial celebrities like Tiger Woods, Mariah Carey, Keanu Reeves, Bruno Mars, and I'm sure we can name many others, mainstream society is reminded that multiracialism is not only our destiny, but our reality. The new face uh, of America is multiracial. It's what many people would promote. Another metric that some people might point to as evidence of a kind of post-racial era is the check all that apply option on the census. So the 2000 census was the first time in US history where citizens could reject government imposed singular identities, where you could pick more than one race. And of course, the election of a mixed race uh, vice president like Kamala Harris has been perceived as the kind of latest milestone in this post-racial era. Obama's presidency, however, shows that beliefs about race and racism, beliefs that race and racism are dead, really ignores the fact that we continue to live in a society that is deeply influenced by, influenced by race with material consequences that affect life chances. So what I'm curious to hear from the class is, do you believe that your generation is more post-racial than other generations? And do you think that this, there's any other evidence that we might point to uh, of a kind of post-racial culture? 
So for the rest of class, I want to talk more specifically about Obama, Obama's election, and this idea of post-racial or racialized politics. So Obama bursts onto the American political landscape as a keynote speaker at the 2004 Democratic National Convention. His speech at the convention catapulted him from this little known Illinois politician to America's newest hope for a post-racial political future. In his address at the convention, Obama makes powerful appeals to unity and hope. And you can see here in his these excerpts from his speech, he talks about how there's no black America or white America or Latino America, but that there is only a united America. And he also talks about these ideas of hope as kind of being powerful ways of, of changing society. Obama's role as a kind of bridge builder and uniter was clearly on display in the racially charged aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in 2005. During this natural disaster, a majority of African Americans believed that the federal response to Katrina in New Orleans would have been faster if the victims had been white. Views this kind of view was articulated by high profile black political figures like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton. Obama's critique of the federal response was actually couched in more race neutral language. He described the Bush administration's response as incompetence and as colorblind and argued that the response revealed a lack of concern for poor inner city residents who happened to be disproportionately white. So Obama here was focusing on the intersection of race and class and urban spaces rather than just focusing on race. While saying it was too simple to accuse the Bush administration of not caring about black people, Obama's rhetoric for from this crisis recognize the role of race in creating the economic conditions that underlay the Bush administration's apathy towards New Orleans victims. In 2006, Obama's brand of kind of race neutral politics had gained a growing appeal among many different audiences. His picture even graced the cover of the October issue of Time magazine displayed behind me with the caption, quote, why Barack Obama could be the next president. The cover story detailed how his transcendence of racial stereotypes have really captured the American public's imagination and how his consensus building style had made him well positioned for a presidential bid in 2008. These kind of media stories of Obama really contrasted his 2008 prospects with those of Jesse Jackson, who ran for president in 1984 and 1988 under the Democratic ticket. Jesse Jackson had a large support base among African-American voters in the Democratic Party, roughly 72 and 92 percent each time that he ran for president but his overall vote share topped out at only about 29% in 1988. Although his attempts at broadening his base had earned him a large proportion of the white vote, a bigger proportion of the white vote than he had received in 1984, Jackson's rootedness in the American civil rights struggle and his unapologetic advocacy for black rights left the vast majority of white Democrats staunchly opposed to his candidacy. So unlike Jesse Jackson, Obama was considered a strong Democratic prospect precisely because his appeal transcended race. Throughout Obama's presidential campaign, he made a concerted effort to steer clear of racial controversy despite the historic nature of his candidacy. If anything, the most pressing racial issue of 2007 was, among many voters, whether Obama was actually, quote, black enough. As the son of a white mother and Kenyan father, Obama lacked African-American ancestry. That factor, combined with his upbringing in Hawaii, generally distanced, and his general distance from the civil rights movement, 
as well as his non-racial campaign messages, had some members of the black community doubting his authenticity as an African-American candidate. It seems really hard to believe with hindsight, but opinion polls repeatedly showed that Hillary Clinton actually had a sizable lead over Obama among black voters throughout most of 2007. The Obama campaign's race neutral approach really helped him win the all important Iowa caucus in 2008, giving him a critical eight point lead over the Democratic frontrunner Clinton. And so it's really the Obama's ability to capture white Democratic votes that allowed him, that propelled him to victory, rather than his ability to capture black voters. So Obama had won what many could call the lily white Iowa caucus uh, with his non-racial message of hope and change, signaling for many a new kind of post-racial political era. The potential election of the country's first black president sharply divided racial conservatives from racial liberals. This phenomena is often described as racialization. So I'd be interested to hear from the class what you think some examples of racialization might be. One, one big one would be uh, affirmative action, right? Or welfare, where the concept of race is deeply, deeply affects your opinion on those issues. So one central psychological argument is that race was actually more chronically accessible to voters in 2008 than it had been in any previous campaign. This kind of accessibility of race had a significant effect on Obama's candidacy. It meant that voters' racial predispositions were in most cases highly accessible to them, allowing racial attitudes to play a major role in informing evaluations of his candidacy. Early research on racialization primarily focused on racial resentful opposition to policies that were unpopular with white Americans and disproportionately associated with Ameri African Americans. However, racialization can just as easily be the product of support for policies that benefit African Americans. The two sides of racialization, racially resentful opposition and racially liberal support, had a larger influence on the presidential vote in 2008 than in any other campaign in modern history. And you can see kind of that the way that racialization played out in terms of how liberal whites approach the question of diversity. So again, I'd like to turn it over to the class uh, and ask you about what ways you feel that the 2020 election uh, engaged in racialized, racialization and how this election is similar or dissimilar from Obama's election in 2008. A study of Obama's campaigns by Michael Tesler and David Sears found several key trends around racialization. First, they demonstrated that evaluations of Obama by the electorate were highly racialized due to Obama's strong support from white racial liberals. Racial attitudes were also strongly at play in the general election. A matchup between Hillary Clinton and John McCain would not have evoked racial predispositions nearly as much as a McCain-Obama choice. Obama overcame this obstacle of racialization by gathering unprecedented support from, racially, from racial liberals early on and activating democratic partnerships against, unpopular, against an already unpopular Republican president. It's also clear that Obama polarized white and Latinos alike along the lines of racial conservatism. Racial attitudes substantially influenced both groups' voting behavior in the Democratic primaries and general election. 
contrary to media speculation, there's actually little evidence that race actually played a stronger role in Latino voting compared to whites. Racial attitudes were also important in determining African American primary vote choices. African Americans who had strong feelings of racial solidarity were about 50% more likely to support Obama over Clinton. Racial attitudes were such a strong determinant of voter choice in the Democratic primary between Clinton and Obama that they helped produce one of the greatest ironies in American political history. Hillary Clinton has long been considered the poster child of feminist politics. Surprisingly, three different surveys show that Clinton performed about 15% percentage points better against Obama with strong gender conservatives. That means gender conservatives supported Hillary Clinton over gender liberals over based on the racialization uh, that polarized people, polarized voters. This kind of paradox really reflects the fact that gender conservatives tend to be conservative about racial issues as well. In other words, racial attitudes were so powerful that they actually made Clinton the preferred choice of, of, among modern day uh, gender conservatives in the Democratic primary. So anti-blackness and racialization wasn't the only kind of factor at play in 2008. General election voting choice was more heavily influenced by feelings about Muslims than in 2004. The polarizing anti-Muslim rhetoric is best captured by media coverage that falsely proclaimed that Obama's middle name was Hussein and therefore signified his Arab Muslim origins. For instance, right-wing pundit Debbie Schlussel smeared Obama in an online article entitled Barack Hussein Obama, Once a Muslim, Always a Muslim. Critics associated an Obama presidency with turning America into a, quote, Arab land that would cost the U.S. the war in Iraq. And it betrayed a kind of underlying belief that being Arab meant being Muslim and meant being a terrorist, an equation that had been activated by the 9-11 attacks and the subsequent war in Iraq. Even among individuals who knew Obama was not an adherent to Islam, anti-Muslim sentiment still shaped their voting choices. As a result, Obama was not only evaluated as an African American, but as someone who exemplified a dangerous and frightening outgroup, as we can see in this uh, comment by uh, former President Donald Trump. So that's all I have for you guys today. Make sure to go on to D2L and fill out the attendance quiz. The answer is terracotta warriors, uh, which are these amazing uh, terracotta statues, hundreds of which were buried in uh, the tombs of a Chinese emperor um, in Shenzhi province. So make sure to go fill out this answer and I'll see you guys in our next class.